Well, good morning, North Point. Good to see you today. Whichever campus you're joining us, I want to take a moment and welcome you. I want to start with the Nixa campus. It is great to, to see you. Vibrant, vibrant, vibrant campus. Good to have you with us. And I want to welcome each of our campuses. So I'm going to encourage you all to help me. Would you welcome our Dream Center campus, our Repmo Republic campus, and our Springfield campus. And keep it going on for those online. Good to have you with us if you're joining us online. Hey, we are excited about uh, this time of year. couple things that I get really excited about. One, it's the fall. Anybody do any of the fall things yet? Okay. Watch football, okay, apple picking, you know, pumpkin spice, whatever you do. Uh, one of the things that my favorite thing about the fall is we've got a lot of college students that live in our region, and uh, we, have, uh, we have a great young adults uh, gathering every Tuesday night. Now, I know it's at the Springfield campus, but it's for each of our campuses, uh, a great place to meet people in the same age and stage of life. It's Tuesday night, 7.30, the Springfield campus, but why I'm sharing it now is because, one, it's that time of year. Secondly, they're having a big, big young adults kickoff this Tuesday night, 7.30. There's a lot of stuff going on prior to it. And it's, uh, if, if, that's, if that's you, man, check it out. It'll be great uh, this Tuesday night. If you're wondering if you're a young adult, you probably aren't. So, but that's all right. That's all right. Um, welcome to let them tell you. Um, but hey, uh, we also have Saturday nights, 5 o'clock at the Springfield Nixon campus. Kind of a fun deal. Let me tell you uh, one, of the, one of the things I like about it. One, it's fall, and so some of you, you kind of schedule your weekend around the Chiefs games and stuff. Uh, I want you to know that they rarely play at 5 o'clock on a Saturday night, and so we have that there. Um, also, uh, not only a great opportunity, those two uh, campuses, um, but there's food every Saturday night afterwards, and I'm just going to, like, pick on Nixa for a second. This is, like, Hispanic Heritage Month, and so Jeremy Alvarez, he is, like, pulling out all the stops, and for the next several weeks, it is like a fiesta that'll make you need a siesta type of deal after every service at Nick's. Uh, so check it out, 5 o'clock Saturdays. Hey, uh, we're diving in uh, to today's uh, topic. We we're, we're just started the series called Free. And, and, and how do I escape the kind of things that trap me in? How do I begin to get outside of where I'm stuck? And, and we're, we're looking at different topics throughout the series. And, and so as we go through this, we're going to talk today about approval addiction. Um, but as, we, as we dive in, we're going to talk about your, your image and your identity. And so you got these things uh, behind me that we're going to look at today. I think it's going to be helpful. But uh, for all of us to take a second, and you, if you're at one of our campuses, you, you, you maybe have this at your seat, or maybe you sat on it and it's now in your seat, wherever it is, if you take a moment and you look at this, this is our arrows out gift. It's a brand new thing in North Point. We've not done this before, but we are going to, three weeks from now, October 5th and 6th, we're going to have a one-week celebration that we all, my hope is that every North Pointer would participate. Everyone who believes in this mission would say, I want to participate, and I want to make a one-time gift, and 100% of that money is going to go outside our walls. Three major things, and there's a lot of other things that we can do if we're able to, but the three major things is Convoy of Hope is an organization we partnered with for many years. We love Convoy, and we really want to help with this feeding initiative around the world. Every single day, thousands and thousands and thousands of, of, of kids rely on the generosity of partners of Convoy to be able to be, be fed and educated and all sorts of things that are going on. We're coming alongside. That's one of the things that we're going to do. Our Springfield Dream Center is my favorite expression of North Point. Point, every single day in multiple ways, trying to love the community. And, and, and so what we want to do is we want to come alongside of them and let this be an arrows out opportunity where we support them in a big financial way. Um, we have our give back events at every campus that we do in December. That's going to be this huge Christmas blowout. So here's what we, we promise. Uh, we don't have like a financial goal. We're not like, okay, if we all do this and we raise... Our goal is participation, that 100% of North Pointers would say, hey, that week, October 5th and 6th, 
um, I want to do something. Everything that comes in that weekend goes out. Everything that comes in for that initiative uh, online uh, that week, it, it'll all go out. And what can we do together? As a matter of fact, we got about 20 projects we can get excited about um, that we would do. Uh, those first three ones are the ones that we're really aiming to hit first. And, and we'll do whatever we can with whatever comes in to make a big impact. You're going to hear about that in the next few weeks, but I want this to be one of those all skates, right? And so again, think about it. Leanne and I, we, we've been praying, like, what, what do we do? Like, what's, what's our role in this? And it's not about what we uh, all can bring in the amount. It's let's all make a statement. Let arrows out. Let's do that. You're gonna, you can read more about that. I trust you can read. Um, if not, we'll put more pictures in it next week, and that'll help everyone. So um, awesome. Okay, so today, very top of our outline, okay? Uh, I, I want to I give us this idea that God has a plan for your life. That's good news, okay? But here's the bad news. So does everybody else. Show of hands, how many of you know someone in your life that's got a plan for your life? Right? Like, your mama's got a plan for your life. Your teacher's got a plan for your life. Your significant other's got a plan for your life. Your, your, your five-year-old kid's got a plan for your life. Uh, your boss has got a plan for your life. Your coworker's got a plan for your life. Your HOA president's got a plan for your life. Your pastor's got a plan for your life. Everybody's got a plan for your life. God's got a plan for your life. Everybody else has got a plan for your life. Today, we want to talk about being freed up from this approval addiction. This, I've got to do what you want me to do. Um, and so we're going to talk about that. Uh, what does it look like to have this approval addiction, this disease to please? What does that look like? Um, it looks like saying yes to things you really don't want to do, but you should do them, right? Like you, you, you end up saying that. Things you don't want to do for people you don't want to do it with, but you do it because you want to look like a good person, right? Now, this is not a message to free you up to be the jerk that you were born to be. That's not what this message is. Um, though that might, be, that might be how to grow attendance. But, but, but this is a message to say, hey, there are some things. Like, like I don't want you walking out here saying, I'm not going to bro- gr- uh, brush my teeth ever again because I realize I'm doing that just for you. Okay. Now, some of that, you do that for you as well and for those you really care about. But bottom line, there are a lot of things we do that we wouldn't do if it weren't for this disease to please. And we're building our image. We're trying to climb this ladder of approval. And this approval we need to be set freed from. You might still do some of the same things, but your motivation isn't to do it to look good. Um, you know, we've all said, we've all said yes uh, to things we, we, we don't want to do. We've all done things to be able to look good. Uh, you familiar with GoFundMe? I'm going to have you bring up my link right now. I'm just kidding. I don't have a link. Okay. Um, but GoFundMe is this fascinating tool. Like, like, it used to be kids had to sell chocolate candy bars for a dollar and then hope you sold more than you ate, right? That's what I did when I was growing up. Now, if you want to raise money, like, GoFundMe. And everybody's got, got you know, and they're powerful. Like, we've all probably are familiar with GoFundMes. And, and here's the most annoying thing for me. Here's, here's why I know I'm a people pleaser, okay? The most annoying question is the bottom of the GoFundMe. There's this little box and it says this. Check this box if you would like this gift to be anonymous. And let me tell you a little bit how my battle goes in my mind. I'm like, why in the world would I want to be anonymous? If I'm going to go out of my way to make a very good contribution, I want the world to know. Not because I think I'm all that. I just want to be a good model and an example of what a good citizen is, right? And so, so, and I find myself thinking, if they never knew I was generous, would I be generous just for the fact of being generous? And I don't like where my head goes when I think about that. Like this week, I was out of town. And Leah and I were, were, uh, were at this, it's kind of like a restaurant, kind of like a 14 meal or kind of like a farmer's market type of deal where there's, there's all these different places to eat. I go to one that is kind of like Chipotle, but it's different than Chipotle because there's a lot more money than Chipotle. And so I didn't know. So I get there and I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm asking for some things and, and I'm not having everything there. And so I'm kind of like, like, can't we just pay by the pound type of thing? Uh, uh, and so, but, but they, they give the chicken and I do that thing that tends to work at Chipotle. Like, hey, can I have just a scotia? more, right? And and usually that's like, they they don't charge for that. They're like, "Mm, all right. And so I said, can I just have a skosh more? And and the the, the dude behind the counter is like, no. And I'm like, 
Like, I, I mean, like, literally, I can. Like, I can. We can figure out how that works, right? But so, but I'm like, I don't want to say anything because I got this demon that I didn't even know was inside of me. It doesn't want to come out. And I'm like, okay, I can't do this right now. But I am out of town, so maybe I can a little bit. But, but I'm like, um, so I'm thinking through this image ladder as he is not being very generous. And I'm like, are you the owner of this? I don't think it costs you any more to do this. Anyway, so we're going through this. We get to the end of this thing, and they wanted $3 for a can of Coke. And I'm like, no. No, I don't, I don't, I don't know what kind of Coke is in there. I think that's a lot of money, okay? And so I'm like, no, just for the principle, and I'm irritated. And so all I have is like a half a bowl of what they're supposed to give me, and it's twenty dollars. I'm like, I need a co-signer just to have a half a dinner. This is not cool. And so I was passive aggressive, okay? Uh, I didn't want it to be obvious that I was being a jerk, but I wanted them to know, hey, this is not the way we expect to do business here. And I was like, twenty dollars? Is that like just for mine? It's like, yeah. And so I'm like, Ugh. so I put my credit card in there. Sorry, Dave Ramsey, if you're watching. Um, and I, I, I pull out my credit card and I just kind of like do one of those verbal eye rolls. I, and go and I get my own cutlery, my own spork, right? As I'm getting this. And then he calls me over. He says, sir, there's one more question that you'd, let, you'd need to answer here before we're done. And you all know what question that is. Would you like to tip? And I'm like, oh, I'll give you a tip, okay? Um, but there's two reasons why I did tip. Number one, I used to work in the food industry. And number two is I have no idea if he can tell if I tip or not when it's facing me. And because of that fear that I look like someone who doesn't tip, I tipped. Now, this is not a lesson on should you tip or not. Maybe you should tip. You should probably always tip. But the lesson for me is, here's what I realized. The only reason I did that there is I was afraid of what I'd look like if I didn't. And I, and I think, you know, how many times do I do that? How many times do we do that? And we're thinking we're building ourselves an image. I don't want, I want you to think I'm a good parent. I want you to think I'm a good employee. I want you to think I'm a good neighbor. I want you to think I'm a good follower of Jesus. I want you to think about all these things. But am I being trapped? And is there something bigger than my image? Is there an identity? Now, side note, your identity is who God has called you. Your identity is who you were created to be. Your identity is that you were born on purpose, with purpose, for purpose. You you are not an accident. You are not an accident. Is you have a purpose. Not only uh, have you been purposed to be here, you've been purposed to be here right now during this generation. You are not an accident. You were born for such a time as this. And, and so when I realize that God loves me, God absolutely has purpose for my life. That's my identity. And my image isn't just bad things. It's good things that I try and work for approval from other voices. So what would it look like if we weren't working for approval, but we were living from approval? Um, uh, I don't know uh, if you all been to, have you all been to SeaWorld before? Okay, <laughs> SeaWorld, man. It's, oh, don't judge me. This is before it got canceled, okay, before that documentary came out. So this is like, like now, totally, I'm on your side. But, but the thing is, before I'd go to SeaWorld, it was awesome. I'd get my big old popcorn, and I'd be watching the Shamu show. And, and you would see these killer whales do the craziest thing. And I'm from the West Coast, right? I'm from the West Coast. And I've, I put quarters in those big old, you know, telescope things. And I've seen whales out in the real habitat. I've never seen a whale jump through a flaming hula hoop. I never had natural. But then at SeaWorld, I'm stuffing my face with popcorn. I'm watching like these people come out and they're doing like their little dances and they're, and they're, and they're doing this. And all of a sudden they're like, here comes Willie. Da, na, 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 na. And this, this killer whale jumps up, does a couple flips through the, and I'm like, wow, that's what I've never seen. That's amazing. How do they do that? And, and then they come out, then the whales come out and they're going to splash the crowd. And they're like, wah, 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 which I probably should not be doing because some of you are like, he's having a medical situation up here. But anyway, they, they, they do whatever they're near their fins or their torso. And they, they begin to splash the front row and everyone's like, <laughs> what crazy personalities. It's like the whale was like, oh, Frank in the first row, watch what I'm gonna do to him. Like, he doesn't even know you're there. All he knows is this. If he's been trained when the whistle blows, if he swims to this spot and he moves his fins this way, he gets fish and they love fish. And you'll notice they're always reaching their bucket and chucking out fish because they will, they will jump through hoops if you feed them what they're hungry for. And we're not all that different. Is if, is if your boss just wants a little more out of you, when you worked an extra 10 hours last week 
and they know they just have to say, man, you know what I love about you? You will burn the midnight oil if that's what it takes. And you're like, yeah, totally. I love doing that. I love more, more, more. That's me. And we jump through hoops. If my coach just notices this out loud, what kind of hoops am I going to jump through? If this person will think I'm, and we all remember what it's like, junior high, senior high, college, right? Maybe you're in it right now. The kind of hoops we jump through to get something we want. We say what we need to say to get what we want to get. And we know that here's the crazy thing. The things that make you popular a lot of times when you're junior high, senior high, in college make you a prisoner when you're out of there, right? Like, like you can't build a whole foundation of doing everything you want to do, saying what you want to say, living for the approval of others. If I live for the approval, if I live for the affirmation, and sometimes we live for the likes. Like we post something on our socials and we're like, man, this is the dinner that I made. 30 minutes later, I got 45 likes. I'm feeling pretty something, right? But then next week, I post something about my kid, my six-year-old, and I only got four likes, and now I'm all bothered, right? Because I'm like, I got a lot more than four friends. What's their problem? They ought to be liking my post about my kid. Don't they like my kid? And what happens is we live for the likes instead of living for love, the identity, the approval of God. So I want us to look at a verse in Proverbs. Some of you are like, oh, oh, we are going to get to the Bible today. Okay, here we go. We, I promise. Okay, Proverbs chapter 29. It says this. It's a dangerous trap. Everybody say trap. It's not everybody, but we'll let it slide. Okay, it's a dangerous trap to be concerned with what others think of you. That's a verse worth memorizing. It's a dangerous trap to be consumed, obsessed, concerned with what other people are thinking of me. But if I trust the Lord, I'm safe. This disease to please has a kick, and it's not helpful. So what's the danger in pleasing, everybody? A couple things I wrote. One, it puts the wrong person in control of my life. It puts somebody else in control of my life. It puts my boss in control of my life. It puts puts, uh, the approval of my neighbors in control of my life. It puts the the, the pleasure of my kids in control of my life. Even good things, it puts them in a God position instead of a good position. And, and then so, so what happens is now, if they're in control of my life, and if my approval, and my, my, my affirmation, that's what I'm seeking, that's what I'm climbing for, I'm building this image, all of a sudden now, I don't have time to be obsessed with what God has for me. I've been to a lot of funerals, obviously as a pastor, um, it's part of the deal, and a partner with families during really rough times. Um, and in all the funerals I've been to, I've never once had a child of someone who was being celebrated go up to the microphone and say, hey, let me tell you about my dad. <laughs> they were the quickest to ever reply to a work email, and I so respect that. Like if anyone from their office would even text them, within 17 seconds, man, my dad would text them back. Like we can be in the middle of a very intense family dinner, but my dad would feel a tickle in his pocket, pull out that phone in the middle of dinner and ignore whatever I was saying and respond to his coworker. And now I really just want you all to know, man, I respect that. He really loved you guys. I've never heard anyone say that. I've never had a printed out profile from LinkedIn passed around while we all listened to somebody. I've never had like um, uh, someone who, who was successful in life, their banker just passed out their financial statements and say, I don't know if you ever knew this, but here's, here's how much money they were worth. I've never, I mean, we've all wondered, but we've never, you know, why? Because when it comes to the most important time of our life and the most important thing of our life, we don't want to have to say, well, I was busy fulfilling everybody else's demands of me. I want to have the time to do what God has for me. Again, the answer of this is not quit your job and just like go live in a cave with your family. Um, the answer though is to say, how do, how, how do I every day, every day wake up, be reminded that I'm living from approval, not for approval, and now no amount of affirmation could redirect me. That God, you have an assignment for my life. God, you have a purpose for my life. So now whatever it is I do, I want to honor you. Jesus uh, models this in in a unique way. In John chapter 6, a little context, Jesus had been what, there's a loaded word called a Messiah, or you'll see the word king a lot of times in, in scripture when it talks about Jesus. The Jewish people for hundreds and thousands of years had been promised that God's son would come down. Their word for the son would be the Messiah. And they believed the Messiah would set them free, would liberate them from the oppressed uh, condition they were in. And, and at this time, in, in the first century, 
century, uh, it was the Roman Empire that was ruling. And so the, the Jewish people believed that God's Messiah, he would be the king. They weren't thinking spiritual king. They were thinking like kick butt king, okay? We're going to, like all of a sudden, we're going to be the world power. Look out, Romans. It's our time, right? And, 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 and they were excited about that. Jesus shows up. He's raising people from the dead. He's multiplying food before Lambert's even thought of it. He's, he's, he's healing blind eyes. He's opening deaf ears. He's communicating the old message in a very timely, fresh way. And people are experiencing God. And here's what we see in John chapter 6. It says, after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who's coming to this world. Jesus, knowing they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again by himself to a mountain. Think about this. Jesus was just Jesusing, and he was doing it very well because that's who he was. The people said, Jesus, we got a great idea. You become our king. Now, I don't want to get political on you, which is always what a pastor says before they get political. (laughs) But if Jesus were running for president this year, I'd probably vote for him. And I'm not meaning that to be offensive because your favorite person is probably my second favorite person, okay? But I would probably still let Jesus have my vote, right? Because I'm like, I'm, I actually think it would be a brilliant idea for him to be our president. Like if Jesus were in charge of educational reform, I'm curious as to what he would say. If Jesus were in charge of, of, of the distribution of wealth and the taxation, I'm interested. I don't think he would mess it up that bad. I'd roll the dice for four years at least, and then we'll vote again. Like, like so while I'm trying to tell you, if you think about it, for them to say Jesus be king is not like, well, that's a stupid idea. You'd be like, yes, be king. It's not a bad thing. It didn't say, Jesus, become the owner of the strip club, please. And he's like, ah, oh, that's naughty. I shouldn't, okay? It wasn't this temptation of doing an evil thing or doing the Jesus thing. It was the war between doing a good thing or doing the God thing. And so Jesus had to say, okay, he could have, if it were me, I'd have been like, well, I'm blushing, y'all. You really, would you vote for me? Like, like for real, like for real? Like seriously though? Like, do you think your friends would vote for me? And what are the three most important issues to you? Like, I would, I would just be interested in a listening campaign at first just to see if it's got some legs. And then I would have a conversation with God the Father and say, God, I just, I, just, I get how you're opening this door. I didn't even see it coming, but yes, I am going to go ahead and be king and I want you to bless my good plan. And a lot of us, We do good things and we have a great image and we ask God to bless our plans. And I'm not saying you should never ask God to bless your plans. I'm just saying, what if you lean into your identity? You don't even need to ask God to bless those plans because he already did. He created them. He designed them for you. And so Jesus, he's like, I'm going to have to give the people around me the gift of goodbye for a season and get alone and get on a mountain and pray. Identity, identity, identity. Because these voices are like, king, 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 we need you, please, you should. And he's like, Father, not my will, but yours be done. And then we see later in John chapter 18, well, here's the, when I say king, like growing up, I grew up in church. And so I have these really weird songs that stick in my head, like an annoying Justin Bieber song, and I can't get it out of my head. And, um, and if you didn't, uh, man, you missed out if you didn't grow up in church. So let me give you a little taste of what you missed out on. Uh, I sang songs when I was a kid, like, you are the king of kings. You are the Lord. You know, so, so see, you, you can always go back and volunteer. But, but what happens is, is we sing these songs. And for me, when I would see things like Jesus is the king, 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 king. You are my king. I love you, Jesus, in my heart. All these things. I'm thinking honor. Woo, you're awesome. Cool. But 2,000 years ago, when it was king, it wasn't like you're the one I love the most. It was like kick butt now. And so there was a king. His name was Caesar Augustus, right? Caesar, 
And Caesar, this is before the whole pizza thing. This is Caesar, though, like he was in charge of the Roman Empire, which is in charge of the area Jesus lived. And, and Caesar had this guy he put in charge of this area that Jesus lived, and he had the authority there on behalf. He was a substitute teacher for this area. His name was Pilate. And Pilate was this guy who had more power than anyone here, but he had to report to Caesar. And if he ever, like, he ever got in trouble, he'd lose his job and maybe lose his life. And so the Jews, they didn't have the opportunity, they didn't have the authority to kill Jesus. They wanted to off Jesus, but they couldn't because it's just this religious Jewish system. They needed to get the stamp from Pilate because Pilate had the stamp that says, yes, it's your hall pass. You may kill this guy. And so they appeal to Pilate and say, hey, can we kill him? And Pilate's like, this sounds like a religious squabble. I don't care. Figure it out amongst yourselves. And then they got smart and they're like, he says he's the king. And is it cool with your job description if you allow someone who says that they're Caesar? Do you think Caesar would be cool with that, Pilate? Because I was just wondering maybe it would be a problem for you. And then he's like, okay, don't send that email yet. Okay, well, so he's interviewing Jesus. And he says it this way. It says, Pilate went back inside the palace. He summoned Jesus and he says, are you the king of the Jews? And what he's saying is, are you a threat? Like, is this a real deal? Are you trying to take us over? And Jesus says, my kingdom's not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest for the Jewish leaders, by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. My kingdom is from another place. He's like, in one of the past, he says, you're right when you say that I'm a king. But I'm not that kind of king. I'm a king of all of us. And it says in Scripture that one day at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is king. He is Lord. But he was not there for the liberation politically. He was there for the liberation spiritually. But if everybody else had their way, he'd have been the physical king. What I'm trying to tell you, no matter how good of a thing you're doing, no matter how good of an impact you're making, climbing the ladder of your image isn't enough. You've got to be founded on an identity. Why are you here? Whose are you? And now what do you reflect? I wrote it down this way, that choosing the wrong audience, audience of one or audience of the loud, choosing the, odd, uh, the wrong audience will cost way more than I budgeted. It will always cost me more than I bargained for. It will always cost me more than I desired. Again, it could be as innocent, and it's all, it could be all moral stuff. It's not about like, uh, man, when you do the wrong thing, you're going to regret it. Like, well, yeah, no, duh, okay? Um, but, but I'm talking about even when you do the good thing, but you do it for an empty purpose, at the end of the day, you're going to be like, why did I spend so much time, energy, focus, mental capacity trying to, why did that voice mean so much to me? Why did I let that become a wound that festered? I was giving that way more authority than I should. We all know what it's like to parent or big brother or big sister or auntie or uncle, a little kid. And when that little kid has their first major bicycle accident and skins their knee, you know what it's like to try and clean their knee and wipe their tears. And that's nothing compared to their first wounded heart. When they come home from school and someone said they weren't enough, as a parent, you're like, okay, what do I do? And I don't want my kids going to school hungry for affirmation. I want them to know who they are, whose they are. They're loved, valued, respected. Identity over image. So two antidotes for the disease to please. If there's some of, some of that inside of you, you're like, ah, maybe. Two things. Well, it's all of us, by the way. So if you're wondering if it's you, just, let's just get there. Yes, it's all of us. Two antidotes. Okay, the first um, is I need to know my alignment, my alignment. And I want us to think about it this way. Okay, so if my alignment, if who I am, I'm trying to prove something. Because where I come from, no one has success, but I'm going to prove that I can. I'm building an image. I'm trying, I'm living for something. I'm living for, and so I start climbing. And I get nervous because when I was 17, I fell off of a 20-foot ladder. Thank God I was on the bottom rung. I would have been hurt. And so I get like, 
So living for something, and I don't know on the... On, I don't know if this translates uh, on our other campuses um, because sometimes when they have to they widen out the shot, you can't tell how high it is. This is a 45-foot ladder. <laughs> so be nervous. Um, and so, um, so, okay, so when I start climbing this ladder, what, what is my motivation? What is your motivation? Because we all climb this ladder to prove we're something. I'm tough. I'm worthy. Whatever it might be. And so a lot of times we climb this ladder and... I don't, my motivation, what will I do for some Cheez-Its, okay? I will get creative. And I don't know what your proverbial Cheez-Its are, but, but we climb for something. Maybe for you, it is, it's social media. I'm gonna post the picture just right. I'm gonna think about this picture way too much. And now I'm gonna watch the affirmation. And my whole mood's gonna be impacted by how many people double tap this post. And you wanna look good, you wanna look right. Or maybe you look at other people's success and you're like, if I can do this different, I'm going to get more attention affirmation. And we climb this ladder. Maybe for you, it's, it's money. And I don't, this isn't a lot of money, but it's all I had left after that lunch. Okay, but, but you have, maybe for you, it's like, I'm going to work hard and, and that's what's going to drive me. I'm going to climb this ladder. And, and, and if you give me enough money, then it's worth it. And then I ask, how fancy does your casket need to be for everyone to be like, like totally satisfied that you made enough money. Now, I'm not anti-money, and if, if you're anti-money, I can help you get rid of it. Just talk to me afterwards, okay? But, like, I'm not anti this. Maybe that's for you. Maybe for you, it's achievement. And you're like, okay, if I just work hard enough, my boss is gonna notice something, right? If, if, I just, if, if, I just, if I just put in the time, then I'm gonna get the opportunity. And I'm not about, putting, uh, about saying don't put in the time and don't get promoted and turn that down. I'm just saying know what you're doing. And if you're trying to, you're trying to work for something, there's no amount of success or recognition or affirmation that's ever gonna be worth it. You're gonna climb and climb and climb. Maybe for you, it's, it's, it's about... The one, it's about a significant relationship. And you're like, if I could ever find someone to complete me, then I'll feel complete. But no one could complete you because that was not their job. It's God's job. You were born complete. You were born worthy. You were born loved. And if you try and look for it somewhere else, you can keep climbing, you can keep climbing. And you're like, and the bummer is, even if you get everything you think you want, you get to the end of this and you're like, why does my bucket feel so empty? I spent all my life climbing to get here, and now that I have it, I don't even know that I want it. And that's empty. Sometimes we get to the spot where we're like, okay, well, now I'm, now I'm kind of stuck. And I'm like, Brad, are you going to catch me? <laughs> and some of you, you, you get up here, and now you're like, I'm stuck. How do I? How do I get down? I wish I could. So this isn't my identity? And you're like, but I'm a good person. I'm like, well, I know you're a good person. This isn't about are you a bad person or not. This is about are you living for the approval of somebody else? That's not the way to live. And so then you carefully, you start to get down. You say, I can't do this. I can't live for for somebody else's approval. And some of you are like, okay, well, here's, here's what happens then. If, if I can't live for the approval of somebody else, well, maybe what I gotta do is I gotta add God to the mix. So yeah, I'm, now I got a foot in both. I go to church, I got baptized, and uh, I'm still gonna do my thing, and this still means a lot to me, and this still drives me, but every day I pay homage to my creator, right? <laughs> Parkour. You're like, okay, I got this. Okay, so I'm still climbing and, hey, God, yeah, you know, like, yeah, I'm blessed and, yeah, I've earned a lot and, yeah, I've worked hard and, yeah, I rolled my sleeve and, yeah, I've done all the principles I need, but, but you know what? <laughs> Honestly, God, I couldn't have done it without you. How much do you want to do this, okay? How, how far are we going to do this, Okay. Some of you are like, okay, well, I'm growing, I'm growing, I want, I want, God, I... I feel like it's getting harder and harder for me to chase the stuff I want to chase and still understand my identity. You're groaning not because of my safety. You're groaning because of your view. I get it, okay? <laughs> and now you're
you're like, I don't know if I can keep going through this thing. This is really difficult and awkward, and I've got a cramp. I really do got a cramp, okay? But I've got one foot chasing this. This is what I've been told all my life, and now I'm like, my identity. Is the answer now saying, okay, how do I jump from here to there? No. It's just climbing down. It's called surrender. So I no longer live because how high? What's in the bucket? It's never enough. It's going to be empty. And it's not bad stuff. It's good stuff. But when a good stuff takes God's place, it's called an idol, an idol. It looks attractive. So I got to say, okay, God, I got to get off that thing. I can't do that. <laughs> the people demanded him to open a show in Branson, but he said no. He said no, my time is not coming. Some of us, you're at that spot. You're like, what I need, the antidote to this is every day saying identity. And some of you are like, okay, I, I got it figured out. Okay, God, whoop. If I get more spiritual, if I give more, if I pray more, if I volunteer more, Will that make me more spiritual? No, but it'll give our kids a really great experience and you should try it. But um, not because, okay, God, now, because some of you are like, no, I've tried the church thing and it's just as empty. Yeah. Because it's not about doing spiritual things for anything. It's not about you reaching up to see what, it's about a God who reaches down. (laughs) It's not about you climbing and achieving and attaining It's not about you living for my approval. It's about you living from my approval. I love you where you are. I grabbed a hold of you, took your feet off the miry, muddy clay, and set your feet on a rock, a solid foundation. And now everything you do, you don't do to strive. You don't do to approve. You don't do to earn. You do to reflect the love that I gave you. That's who you are. Like, I'm from the West Coast. And the West Coast... We, we didn't barbecue. We thought we did until I moved to Missouri. The first time I came here, I invited a bunch of the staff over for a barbecue. And we get there, and one of them had just not enough social awareness to say it out loud, said, I thought we were coming for a barbecue. I'm like, we are. I got burgers and dogs. I'm not, like, that's not a barbecue. That's a grill out. I never heard of a grill out in my life. I didn't know there's a difference. Apparently, what I thought was a barbecue is a grill out. You just throw something on, on the barbecue and you let it. But well, I guess a barbecue involves a little more science. You've got a temperature. You've got a gauge. You've got an app. You've got an egg. You've got, you know, something fancy. You've got marination. You know, that's a barbecue. And so you know what I stopped having at my house? Barbecues. <laughs> yeah, I'm welcome to grill, grill something with you. But the barbecue is, like, like, if you came to my house and I served steak or chicken, right, you would know, like, 45 minutes ago when Leanne said that we were having company, that's when Jeremy put this in the marinade, okay? Because it tastes like it. But if I go to a barbecue, like, some of y'all, like, you know how to do that? Like, that thing's been soaking since Tuesday. And when, when I eat that and cut it open, every fiber is influenced and impacted by what it's been soaking in. And what I see, neither height, nor depth, nor principality, nor power, nothing can separate me from the love of God. It's not, it's not what I do, it's who I am. I was born on purpose, with purpose, for purpose. That's who I am. God is wild about me, he loves me, and I let it soak and marinate till it divides the very soul and fiber of my body so that every fiber of my body has the influence of God's identity in my life. That's my assignment every day. The second thing is my, uh, that's my alignment. And then the second thing is my assignment. My assignment is what I do with that knowledge. My assignment is my purpose. The antidote to pleasing other people and living for an audience of many is simply to know I'm here for a purpose. And so I get to know my identity. I'm accepted, I'm loved, I'm worth, worthy. And now every day, it doesn't mean I have to quit my job and get a job at a nonprofit. What it means is, how do I live in such a way today that the love of God flows through me? 
That's what I want to do. Like, like, how do I live in a way where I reflect the love I've received every single day? It's going to impact how I coach that team. It's going to impact how I handle that conflict at work. It's going to impact how, how I, I, what I do and what I don't do. They become the guardrails for my life. The guardrails for my calling are, is, is the, the alignment I have with God and the assignment I have from God. Those two things every day. Yeah, I become, I let those things become a guardrail. Y'all know what a guardrail is, right? Springfield, Dream State, Republic. Anybody ever use a guardrail before? <laughs> I never like it. I'm never like, sweet, I found a guardrail. Okay, like that sucks. Um, but I'm always thankful the guardrail was there because it kept me from <laughs> those guardrails of my alignment with God, my identity, my assignment from God, my purpose. They become my guardrails in life. Everything I do, they keep me in. I look like a, well, if you look at my life, I probably spiritually look like a six-year-old driving a bumper car for the first time at Incredible Pizza. And that's all right. I go fast and furious until I hit something I know leads me out of my assignment or my alignment. And when I realize if I do that, that's not who the person that God created me to be, that's my guardrail. And I establish that guardrail. Is, is it, if I do this activity, it allows me to demonstrate the kind of things in a way that brings wholeness to a broken world around us. That's my assignment. And I let my purpose, my identity be the guardrails of my life. Some of you, you're in a really awkward spot trying to have a foot in both worlds. What if today your next step was saying, not quit everything you're doing, but quit the why that you're doing it for? And every day you say, God, I just want to rest in you. And now I want to live from your approval. Last thing I wrote in my notes uh, is Jesus offers me freedom from the bondage. It really is a bondage, the trap, the slavery of other people's approval. I wish every one of you had the kind of parents and godly mentors who would have looked you in the eye when you were very impressionable and said that you're loved, you're accepted, you're worthy. I got a feeling you're going to climb a lot of ladders in life. Just know you don't have to, to earn any of it. Do it from your identity. And the truth is, some of the people who were trusted to speak that in your life didn't do it. So you have to course correct And let me say that to you today. You are loved. You are worthy. You're created with such awe. All of heaven stopped and stared. And you've got an assignment that can only be done from you. And every day, hang out with that alignment. Focus on that assignment. Those ladders will come. Those ladders will fall. You're not worried about scaling them. And you'll recognize when they're the wrong one. And when we do that, We influence those around us in the way God designed us. So let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us to recognize where we're at, where we're trying to balance both worlds, and you would help us to climb down a ladder of doing something for, and we would hang on to the very base of doing something from, that we would live from your approval. Lord, I pray for those who've never made that their confession, that today would be the day you become their foundation. Forgive the sin, forgive the misdirection, and forgive the empty good things that we do as a foundation and from this day forward, set our feet on a new path from a new place. In Jesus' name we pray.